Hey, welcome once again to our online worship experience. And, and I say experience because it's not just about you watching, but hopefully it's you participating, that you're able to settle in and have your Bibles opened. I would say even this would be kind of cool, since we don't yet have music a uh, part of this, that, that maybe you just you dive into Spotify and pull up some, some really good Christ-centered worship music. And, and you could almost have your own worship experience in terms of just singing praises, having prayer right there wherever and whenever you are. And then I get the opportunity, and how fun is this, to lead you in the Word today. And uh, as I say that, uh, I want to go ahead and just jump right into Acts Uh, chapter 10. I want to welcome you back, first of all, uh, to our series in the book of Acts. Uh, By the way, just time out. My name is Jason, the lead pastor here at First Baptist in Fordo. If you are new to this experience with us, but here's what we've been doing. Going through the book of Acts, exploring how God works through the ordinary rhythms and routines of our lives. And if you're familiar with the book of Acts, It really begins at the feet of Jesus, where Jesus had poured into what we might say were just some ordinary guys, that there was nothing special about them except Jesus had poured into them. And through their commitment to know him, love him, follow him, Jesus gives those original disciples this promise. And it really is a promise for us too, not just for them. It begins with them in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts 1a, and this is our theme verse. You might call it our platform verse for the year uh, 2022 here at First Baptist. And it goes like this. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Like my hands and feet, people see you. It points to me is what he's saying. You'll be my witnesses beginning where you are where your relationships are already being developed, you go to where your relationships are taking you. And sometimes that is very natural, uh, organic, whatever that might look like. But where you are for them was Jerusalem, expanding into all Judea, Samaria, and to ultimately the end of the earth. That was the outline for the book of Acts. It really is an outline or a platform for us thinking about what ministry looks like for us here at First Baptist in the year 2022. And so as you think about that verse, Acts 1-8, and you're familiar with the book of Acts, you might begin to think about some of the big players, the heroes of the book of Acts, besides the Holy Spirit. He is the true hero of the Bible, certainly of the book of Acts. But but you might think of those who lived in the power of that verse, you know, some big names like Peter and Paul and those original apostles like John and James, maybe Barnabas or Silas or even Timothy living in the power of that verse. And, and those are good things. And we preach a lot with uh, understanding who those people were and how they were instruments in God's hands to advance the gospel. But this series is more about those whom you would not think of that oftentimes they were positioned just right to be instruments for God, but maybe we don't even know their names and maybe there's nothing else mentioned about them. Let's just say they were ordinary people who loved Jesus. Maybe at the time they didn't even love Jesus yet. God worked in their life in a way that at the right place, right time, they were part of God advancing the gospel. And sometimes they're not even named. We don't even know who some of these people are, which is important because it invites us into the story to think about what about you? What about me? Just ordinary people get up every morning, right? Put our pants on one leg at a time the same way as everybody else. But yet God works through the ordinary. And here's our big truth. Here's our big truth today. And it really goes throughout the whole series that there are infinite opportunities for God to work in the ordinary when we, when you and I look to the God who is infinite, we've got to be focused on him. We see that truth again today in Acts chapter 10. I've already mentioned that's where we're going to be. We see a guy named Cornelius. He was a Roman Gentile. He was Italian. Just, you might say, fairly ordinary. I don't know what that means. Let's just put normal in quotation marks. But he invites Peter 
into a spiritual conversation. God was bringing them together. And here is Cornelius inviting Peter into a spiritual conversation. Just a, what we might call an ordinary, a routine day for him in Caesarea where we pick up reading Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household, like his family. He led his family to know God, to worship God. And he also gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed continually to God, meaning that he had a relationship such that, a perspective such that he was always in dialogue, talking and thinking about God. Now, here was this day uh, in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who was called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended to him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Let's stop right here for prayer. Father, thank you for these moments of your word and how you speak into our lives. And Lord, we see here this opportunity from maybe an ordinary or just a routine type of afternoon that God, you showed up in the ordinary and you're a God who does that. But Lord, here's what we see about Cornelius, a, a heart of a man who was humble to receive. What, what does that look like and how having that humbled heart to receive really opens up opportunities even in the ordinary rhythms and routines of our lives? Do we have a heart like that? We ask the question here as we dig into Acts chapter 10. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we see here Caesarea, it's mentioned to us as a city, and it was located, still is, about 70 miles north and a little west of Jerusalem. Now, by the days of Cornelius, Caesarea was a big thing. Like, it was the Greco-Roman hub in Judea. That back in the days of Herod the Great, about 60-something, maybe 70 years earlier, King Herod the Great had made it this, had turned it into this metropolitan city. It had theaters, shops, and even a temple made there to worship Caesar, that it was a hub for Greco-Roman culture. All of this physical and economic progress, even uh, beginning in the days of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor there for Judea would have lived and had his headquarters primarily in Caesarea. So there was all of this marketplace an economic advancement, Greco-Roman culture, this hub there in Judea. But here's what we don't see. We understand that there was very little gospel witness happening there in Caesarea. A lot of Gentiles lived there, but there was very little gospel witness. Some scholars believe that the servant named Philip that we read about back in Acts chapter 6 and chapter 8, that he was from that area and there was a Jewish population there, but there was no or very little gospel witness. In other words, here's what wasn't happening, that the gospel had yet to cross over that ethnic divide between Jews and Gentiles. The gospel and the church was made up of people who had a Jewish ethnic background that the gospel had not crossed over that barrier or that divide between Jew and Gentile until this moment. 
And I would encourage you as just homework to read this week all of Acts chapter 10. It's fascinating how God was working both ends in the life of Peter, in the life of Cornelius, bringing them together. And I've taught through this before in terms of how important it was for Peter to receive that vision from God and be open and faithful to go across those barriers that Peter was willing to reach out in faithfulness to God and experience God advancing the gospel beyond the Jewish people into the lives of people who were Gentile or people of the nations. That's a big deal. That had never happened before. But in our focus today, think about this guy named Cornelius. I mean, like this. Of all the Gentiles there in Judea and in particular Caesarea, Why him? Why did God choose him to be that very first Gentile who would respond positively to the gospel? And and as we think about this experience, God bringing them together and working this out to advance the gospel, there are some things about their experience that will teach us how God steps into the routines of ordinary and will make some amazing things happen. That could be your life today. It could be my life today. What was it about Cornelius that we can learn from in our own journeys of faith that will make a difference today? As we dig back into this, we see, first of all, the importance of this. The importance of being available. Now, we'll see that in Cornelius in just a moment. But stop here and think about your own life that the moment you get out of bed, there is a demand for your attention. Like people want you to be available. That may mean keeping up with your streaks on social media or your posts on Facebook or responding to that text, responding to that email, answering that phone call, making yourself available at the breakfast table, the dinner table, getting to where you need to be at school or getting to where you need to be at work with meetings and appointments and classes and all these things. You and I understand the importance and the demands of being available. So did Cornelius. Look what we see here in verse 1. Cornelius there in Caesarea, he was a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Let's stop right there. Being a centurion in the army, the Roman army, would be similar to being a captain in the United States Army. He was in charge of at least a hundred men, and these soldiers had come down from Italy. They had come down from Italy to be stationed in Caesarea to protect the city and even more specific to protect the Roman interests in that city. So picture that being stationed there. Their job was to manage and oversee and protect the status quo of the city. And that meant every day, 24 hours a day, every day, seven days a week, all day to be stationed there to protect the status quo of the city. And I say that to say that as the leader of those soldiers, Cornelius would have been a busy guy, especially having his family there, his life there, being stationed there. It was a 24-7 kind of responsibility, seven days a week. Maybe he took time off, but he would have been a busy guy. He needed to be available. But yet at the same time, with all of those demands on his time and his attention, we see verse 2. Let's read this. Yet he was also a devout man. Devout meaning he was devoted to something. Something was important to him. It was high priority. He was someone who feared God. And that word means to to worship. He, He had a reverence for God. And not just that, but also his household He gave alms generously to the people and he prayed continually to God. So it seems that he was engaged as a father. He was engaged as a husband. He was a family man. He led his family spiritually. Now, they did not know Jesus yet, but there was something about his life, maybe from the Jewish influence, that God meant a lot to him. That this sense of being devout, fearing God, is that he was committed to God out of reverence to God. Ultimately, we would say this, he had a high view of God, that God was important 
to him. And he lived that way. It's so important not just to say that God's important, but to live that way. And you begin to see priority that if God, if he had a high view of God and God was important, that he budgeted his life that way. By the way, we see he budgeted his finances that way. God's important, then he leaves room to be available to God with his finances. Some of us, man, we spend to the limit. We don't save, and even if we do, here's the way we live. We live as if we're the priority and not God. We see here with Cornelius that he had a high view of God, and he budgeted that way so he could give generously to ministry alms to the people. But not only that with his finances, but with his time, that precious resource of time that we see that even though there was so much demanding of his time that that literally he had to be available, that he made himself available to God. He prayed continually out of this devotion and reverence that God was important. He did not yet know Jesus, but still there was something about Cornelius that he budgeted to be available to God. Now, that, that's so important because it was that availability. And we, we don't know what he was praying about. He didn't yet know Jesus. He wasn't praying in Jesus' name, but there was some relationship. He was reaching out to God. And it was, when, listen, when, when prayer became an ordinary part of his routine, God began to step into that routine. Look what we read, we read in verses three and four. About the ninth hour of that day, and he's praying. And he sees this vision of an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And, and first of all, he's scared. It caught him by surprise. This had never happened before. Literally, God stepping into his routine. And so he stared, verse 4, at him in terror. And all he could come up with was, you know, what do you want, Lord? What, what, what is it, Lord? And the angel spoke. Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, I I love that. I don't know about you, but I love that God already knew his name. That God had been listening to his prayers. God knew that he had been generous. That got the attention. God is watching us. And he knew the way that Cornelius had positioned himself to be available to the things of God. And when prayer became a normal part of his routine, God stepped into that routine to meet him where he was. And very practically, very simply, it comes down to Cornelius positioned himself to be available. And God was able to step into that availability. I would encourage you with this challenge this week. Just think about what you budget those most precious things on right? Like your resources, your financial resources, your time. And and think about this. Are you someone who loves God so much that you live that way, that you budget that way, that you leave that room to be available for God? And, And maybe this week, as you look at that, you're like, you know, I need to make some adjustments in what I'm spending on, in what I'm spending money on, what I'm spending time on. I need to adjust priority because I see here God working in the ordinary but if I'm too busy if I'm filled up with so many other things I'm not available for God that I miss God in the ordinary because I'm simply not available here with Cornelius we see first of all the importance of being available to God but we also see this this is key the importance of being teachable not just available but also teachable. When the angel went away, we see an urgency as we read how Cornelius responded. He gets the instructions on where Simon Peter is to be found, and we pick up reading in verses 7 and 8. When the angel who spoke to him had left or departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended to him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now I picture Cornelius is on the job. Like literally he cannot break away to go himself and even the angel anticipated him sending others who would go and find Peter. 
So there's Cornelius. There's an urgency. And so he can't go himself. He's on the job. He's stationed. He's on patrol leading those soldiers. And so what he did was he took two of his closest servants. He gave them military support with that soldier who also trusted God. And he sent them off to go and find Peter. Now, here's an interesting thing. We've already read that he was devout that he feared God. And so he was already religious. He already had some understanding of God, but yet here's this message of something new to be learned, that he needed to hear and learn and be taught something else from the word of God. And we see this urgency that Cornelius was interested. He was curious. And so he sends immediately these, this entourage to go and find Peter. And, and we see just how curious and interested he was. If you look over uh, near the end of the chapter in verse 33, when Peter finally arrives at his house some three or four days later, we see Cornelius telling Peter, so I sent for you at once. Like immediately there's an urgency. And you have been so kind to come now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord to tell them. They were ready to listen and learn and hear. And you'll even notice this. It would seem that like when Cornelius was anticipating a few days later that Peter would be arriving, that he took the day off from work. He made sure he was going to be at home and not by himself. He even had his whole family and some close friends there because they were hanging on every word. Here was something new they needed to learn and they were ready to hang on every word of what Peter was going to say. Now the angel set this up and I've wondered, well, why didn't the angel just share that teaching himself? Why did they need to get Peter involved in all of this? And, and it goes back to this, the importance of the message. Peter needed to be involved so he could see God at work in the lives of these Gentiles. Peter would be the eyewitness of that to take that back to the church in Jerusalem to say, hey, it is legitimate that God is working now beyond the Jews into the lives of Gentiles. That had never happened before. This was a dynamic, defining moment between Peter and Cornelius and his family. But I want you to see this. It never would have happened if Cornelius had not been, yes, available, but also teachable. I mean, he was already religious. He knew about God, but he didn't yet know Jesus. And it invites that question. Is there something you need to know beyond just knowing about God to be in a right relationship with God? Is there something more that you need to grow in your walk and your knowledge of God? Here's what happens sometimes, especially with us right here uh, in the South, is that we've been around church, right? Our grandparents took us to church probably, that we grew up in church, or maybe we've been around church, and we get to a place where we're just not teachable. We think we know what we need to know, and we miss out knowing that God is so infinite that we can never know and get our minds around all of him. There's always something new to learn, to grow in your walk with him. And oftentimes, listen, if in your routine you're not teachable, you will then miss those teachable moments. God has something new to show you, to teach you, to challenge you. And very often, listen, but we become complacent in our faith. We become sometimes even stagnant, even lazy that we think, well, I've been there, I've done that, I can check mark this box in my relationship of what it means to be church. And God is challenging us to grow. He is stirring us sometimes to greater godliness and righteousness. There are things maybe you don't know that you need to know that will change everything in your relationship with God. Cornelius was not only available, he was teachable, praying positioned and yearning. And when he knew there was something he needed to hear, they were right there ready to hang on every word. That's so important. When teachable is part of your ordinary routine, you will experience those teachable moments. You won't miss them when God has something new for you to learn. That's important. 
But here's our final truth today. Not just the importance of availability and teachability, but also this, the importance of being insatiable. I love that word. It's one of my favorite. The importance of being insatiable. Now, here's what that word means. Never being satisfied. And sometimes we think about never being satisfied when it comes to the accumulation of worldly things like wealth and material possessions. That's not what we're talking about here. Because here's the thing with Cornelius. He had all those things. He had every reason to be satisfied at that stage of his life. He was successful. He had a good reputation. He was religious. He was seeking to live a moral life, that he, he had a career, he had a family, he had his religion. It seems that in his own effort there in Caesarea, that in his own doings, he had everything he needed to live a good and prosperous life. And yet, through what God was doing here, bringing him together with Peter and Peter's, these other disciples that were with Peter, we see that even at that stage, there was something very important that was missing from Cornelius' life. What was that? Well, flip over here with me near the end of the chapter. This again is still in Acts chapter 10. We pick up and we read in verses 44 and 45. While Peter was still saying these things, literally sharing the gospel of Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers who were there with Peter, the believers from among the circumcised, meaning that those believers came from the, the Jewish sect, like they were, the, they were ethnic Jews who had become believers also in Christ, but they had a Jewish background. They had come along with Peter. Now they're all eyewitnesses of what God is doing there at the home of Cornelius. They were amazed because why? The gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on those Gentiles who heard the gospel and they believed. Up until that point, Cornelius, his family, they knew God. God was important to them, but they did not know Jesus. Why was that so important? Well, think about it. Up until this moment, Cornelius was successful, but he didn't know Jesus. Cornelius was religious. But he didn't know Jesus. He had a good reputation. He had a family. He had all of these things that we would say, man, that makes a good life. But Jesus was missing from his life. And here's how that's a challenge for us, especially growing up in a Western culture, is that we tend to look around us and we say, you know what? I live in that neighborhood. I've got the house, I've got the car, I've got the job, that I have the spouse, that I have a career, I have a family. And very often, we don't even notice that Jesus is missing from our lives. In fact, you might even hear this question, why do I need Jesus if like Cornelius, I have all these other things? And yet God, going out of his way, stepping into the availability, stepping into the teachability because Cornelius didn't need to be satisfied about where he was in that season of life. God had something more that he needed to be right with God. Jesus himself would say, this is why it's so important. In in the words of Jesus in John 14, 6, Jesus says this, that he, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one has that relationship with the Father except through him. Here's why Jesus is so important. He is the only one who can take your sin, who can satisfy the judgment against your sin, and give you in exchange the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we see the Holy Spirit poured out on these Gentiles, it was through their personal faith in Jesus. Without that, there was a separation that their sin would still be counted against them because he's the only one who can satisfy your sin. He's the only one who lived the perfect life as God in the flesh. And by that perfection, he wasn't dying for his own sins. So when he laid his life down on the cross, that sacrifice perfectly atones, meaning that it satisfies what you deserve to pay for your own sin. He wasn't paying for his own, so as a substitute, he's paying for yours. You trust in him. 
all of your sin buried with him, nailed to that cross, removed. He takes it and in exchange gives you in that new beginning, your life wiped clean, the forgiveness, the hope he pours out. You have now the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is truly relationship with God. So yeah, Cornelius knew about God. He worshiped God. He went through the motions even of being religious. But this was that defining moment of receiving what had been missing from his life all those years, all those years. And, and here's the thing, never being satisfied. Here's my, maybe this, maybe this is you. Maybe this is you, is that you've, you've lived your life up to this point and you don't even realize that Jesus is is missing. I'll never forget this. One afternoon, coming back to my office in the courthouse, and I had just won a big case. And I remember seeing myself in the mirror, and I just stopped for one of those vain, prideful moments. I was still dressed in my Joseph A. Banks suit, which, by the way, is not that expensive of a suit, but I thought it was nice. And I was sitting there just kind of admiring me for a moment, with just saying, oh, look at me, I just won this case, and people were congratulating me, and it was a moment about me. But I promise you this, words that I had read earlier in the day out of my Bible came back to haunt me, to, to challenge me. And, I, and it's not gonna be on your screen, it's just something that I'm just now thinking of, but it comes out of Mark chapter eight. Jesus says this, what does it profit a person if you gain the whole, the whole world? and yet you lose your very soul. I mean, those words spoke into me, humbled me in that moment. And right there in my office, I closed the door and I just got down on my knees and I said, God, forgive me. I have made life about all of these successes and reputation and making a name for me. And I have forgot. I want to make sure in this moment that I get it right, what matters the most. And that is having Jesus in your life. That, that moment of trusting him and committing your life to following him. Because here's what happens. Maybe up to this point, your life has been all about all those other things like Cornelius, it's about all these other things. Even being religious seems a good thing, but it can sometimes bring you to a place you don't even know Jesus is missing. You don't even know it. But here's the thing, here's my hope for you, that God will never let you be satisfied until you get that most important thing right. That God will never turn loose of you, that he will work it out, stepping into the ordinary, the routine of your life to say right here is intervention. You got to know Jesus. When all that other stuff in your life, when the things of this world pass away, if you don't have Jesus, you will be left empty and separated from God. So here's my prayer as we get ready to close. It's simply this. Don't let the things of this world try to satisfy you. My prayer is God will never let you be satisfied until you have that most important thing in your life is committed with Jesus at the center, that most important thing to know him, love him, commit to him, to follow him, never being satisfied. By the way, that is the testimony of a guy named Wayne Heisinga Jr. And I shared his testimony, I think a couple of months ago. You can find it on IamSecond.com. IamSecond.com. And it's a fascinating story because he grew up very wealthy. His dad, Wayne Sr., owned this big waste management company. And they sold the company. The way I understand it is they had all of this wealth they invested it in other things like the Miami Dolphins football franchise, all kinds of other ventures. So Wayne Jr. grew up with everything in the world that the world had to offer. I mean, I'm talking helicopters, airplanes, cars, houses, neighborhoods, whatever that the world had to offer. And yet, as he began to get a little older, there was this, this, this stirring in his spirit that something was missing. It's like we, could, we can look back and say God was not going to let him be satisfied. The importance of being insatiable for the right reasons. There was, there was a hole, something missing from his life. And he literally began praying about that. And, and the phone rang soon after that. And he had the opportunity of all things. God works in so many crazy ways. Kind of like bringing Peter 
to Cornelius' house there in Caesarea, God led Wayne Jr. on this trip to get on a nuclear submarine, a U.S. submarine, to go on this cruise. I mean, who does that? But on that cruise, he met the captain of the sub. And there was just something different about the guy. Just a joy that was bigger than the moment. Just something about him captivated Wayne. And so Wayne asked to be able to meet with him again. And I don't remember how they met. Maybe it was lunch. Maybe it was fishing. I don't know. But Wayne just had to ask him, hey, Captain, what, what is different about you? That opened the door for the captain of that sub to share his faith in Christ, to, to begin to speak into Wayne's life this teaching about Jesus that he had never really heard and embraced before. What I just shared with you about Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, what that means for you. Ultimately, the sub-captain said, if you don't have that, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have him, then nothing else will compare. You will always have that emptiness. Now, I'd love to say Wayne believed right away. He didn't, but it planted a seed that led him to go to church by himself one Sunday morning to hear that gospel repeated. And God began to take that and pour into his life, leading him to become a believer, filled with the Spirit, impacting his family. Wayne Jr. would never be the same. All those other things, man, even good things, God never let him be satisfied. And so that changes everything. Maybe it changes something important for you today. I hope that it does as we bow in prayer here to close our message. Father, this brings us to a place of, of examining our own lives. Even if we're religious, even if we, we would say that we go to church or we watch church or we participate online, whatever that looks like, here's the reality of asking some questions. Do, do I leave routine in my life? Is there opportunity how often in my life, in my routine, am I thinking about you, God? To be hungry for the things of God, to, to dig into my Bible that way and other resources that help me grow. How often do I, am just in my routine, am I thinking about you? How often in my routine am, am I growing? Am I praying? Am I leaving room? How often in my routine, Lord, am I, am I spending time with you? Not just thinking about you, but spending quality time pouring in, Lord, that, that relationship, investing in that. And, and oftentimes we, we get to this, this final question that really speaks into our lives. Have, have we, have I allowed the things of this world to keep me separated from you? That, that fill me up and I'm not available. That fill me up and I'm not teachable that fill me up and somehow I'm trying to be satisfied on things that just can never satisfy. Am I allowing that? As I think about the routines and the rhythms of my life, am I making room? Do I budget that way to be available to you, to be teachable? And certainly at the end of the day, the only thing that can fill me up is you. Knowing Jesus, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in my life. I pray that relationship, Lord, filling me up now, but also those who are participating with me in this worship moment. Make it so. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you have questions about this message, the gospel, here's what I would, I would say, reach out to us. We wanna be a resource for you. But I also want to challenge you in this is that, yes, we want to be about good content and sharing the Word of God, the whole counsel of God. We want to share that with you. But then what do you do with it? I hope that you embrace and that you go deeper and dig like this week, reading all of Acts chapter 10. But what does community begin to look like? I mean, God wants to take that and begin to see you building relationships around you. Maybe that means that you come and have an in-person experience with us. That's important to us. Being here on this campus on Sunday morning, whether it's upstairs at 10, that's more traditional. Downstairs at 11, it's gonna be more contemporary. Just a different atmosphere. Same God, same faith, same Holy Spirit, same leadership, but just difference in atmosphere. 
difference in experience, we'd love for you to be part of that. But maybe that's not where you are or maybe that's not possible for you, but still think about what does, what, what does community begin to look like for you? It could mean that as you watch this, as you participate, you're not doing it by yourself. You're inviting family. You're inviting friends. Maybe you become a watch party. You become a life group. We would love to have that connection of sharing in ministry that leads to relationships right where you are. And so listen, stay tuned just for a few minutes, our website, and you can find out more information about how to begin building those relationships. We'd love to help you. Until we share this moment again, God bless you.